Welcome back to episode 142 of the Disorganized Wizard Club podcast. My name is Alex. I'm here as always with Adam. Hello. And Cam. Howdy. And we're a group of Ottawa-based players that play just about anything and everything we can qualify for. We talk about decks, tournament stories, just about anything that you and ourselves get better at magic. Most definitely. Yep. Most certainly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the promise. That's the Money promise. back guarantee. <laughs> yeah. Money back guarantee. Don't know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. <laughs> Side effects may include. <laughs> Confusion, drowsiness, <laughs> inability to operate a motor vehicle. Ah, inability to operate a scheduler. Oh, yeah. We can't do that. You'd think that, like, after all these years, we'd just record at a consistent time of the day, but. Yeah, I was going to say, last, we went from, what, nine in the morning to now. Nine at night. Ten at night. Definitely ten at night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know which version of us is a better podcaster, but I still feel as brain dead. Uh, I think evening's better. <laughs> at least I, I feel I myself, and I'm guessing Adam's more alert at night. So that's, that's a big fact. <laughs> I'm miserable in the mornings. I hate the mornings. They should be banned. That's what I was saying. Yeah, we, yeah, we were talking this about this last, last week. week. Yeah. yeah. Ban Hogak, ban mornings. Ban mana advantage. Ban mana advantage. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> yeah, but well, you can ban it after we play it. At, yeah, at the at the let team me, event. Let me take down a couple of tournaments first, like yeah, the I'm, one this weekend here in Ottawa, sponsored by the Wizards Tower. Great sponsor <laughs> of this podcast. We've got an MCQ here in town at the Nepean Sports Black, August tenth, this Saturday. If you're in the area, come check it out. It's going to be a great tournament. And check out WizardTower.com while you're at it. Yeah, Your source for Magic Singles here in Canada. No doubt. Other podcasts you like the Commanders Brew. Yep. Cool dudes. A lot of great stuff on their website. Check them out. You can come check us out at the MCQ or in two weeks from now, you can come check us out at SCG Richmond. Yeah. Where we're coming to battle minus Cam. Yeah, DWC Light. Yeah. yeah. It's DW plus Hemsley. <laughs> <It's just, laughs> the club's gone. Just disorganized <laughs> wizards. <laughs> no official yeah. club status. Yeah, that's going to be a fun weekend. It's my birthday weekend. Yeah, should and, be awesome. Uh, Make the trek. Love yeah. team events. Yeah. I think there's so much fun. Don't care if you lose. Like, don't care if you win. I don't know. There's just so much fun. I've only played one, like, actual, like, big team event, GP Detroit, a few years ago. Like, yeah. It was Magic Origin sealed. And I had a blast. It was so much fun. Yeah. Team events are the best. Yeah. We played the one here that Tower did too, right? Yeah. But I'm, I'm not counting. That I'm talking small. like a big. Oh, like a big one. Big, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're super fun, though. Because, like, I don't know. It's, just, it's like hard to get tilted when you're with the team. Yeah, nothing's your fault. Yeah. Yeah, it's always my teammates. Or you were unlucky. <laughs> this you is actually I mean? a really weird uh, thing to note that it's hard to get tilted in magic team events because, like, oh, it's not your fault or you got unlucky, whatever. Like, everyone's just having fun. Where every other team game online is very toxic because <laughs> it's your teammates' fault. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Hey, yeah, what's the difference? Do you think if you just 1v1 your lane in league and that decided whether you won or not, and then there was like team events across like or any like Dota or something? You know oh, yeah, I mean? it's, it's so that you, yeah, online, you like assume that your teammates are messing up what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, because the games aren't separate. Yeah, because the games aren't separate, right? Because I'm like, I smash like a smash top lane, then just like look at the rest of yeah. the map, and I'm like, oh, wait. I guess this is why, e uh, this might be why like I don't like EDH because like you can attack out of your lane. Yeah, exactly. You gotta stay in your lane. Yeah, I'm just trying to have a one v one game, and these other people are messing up. No ganks allowed. <laughs> yeah, please, no ganks. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to power farm over here. Yeah, so I don't know. That's probably why, because it's like you're just playing the game like normally. Yeah, it's weird though. Hey, that's a weird distinction between the two, because it's like, yeah, the team events are so much fun. I guess it's probably just because you're hanging out with your friends and stuff, and yeah, and also it prevents, I find, people, opponents from being like toxic to you as well. Because they're gonna look like jerks in front of their friends, you know what I mean? Like, and in front of multiple people. Whereas, like, in one v one, some guy's just like being a jerk. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, I guess. You know, like, what are you gonna do about it? Do you think people cheat lefts because they feel because it would uh, DQ their team as well? Yeah, definitely. Probably not. Or <laughs> I, I guess mean, if you, I don't know if you're don't intending the to cheat, like the cheaters out there, you know, if you're intending to cheat, you probably just get a team of other people who are willing to do it with you. I don't know. I feel like famously players who cheated like were like delusional about like their skill or like did it you know like in secret it was like a private mm -hmm. thing they like, were, like they were like also really, probably yeah. ashamed about it too like okay. i think i don't know like the famous cases of people getting caught it's like they tried to like hide it from everyone like including themselves mm -hmm. almost like 
oh, this is the first time I ever cheated. You know, like they yeah. always say that in their statements. Like, come on, dog. Like, you've been cheating the whole <laughs> Get time. Out I'm of like, here. yeah. <laughs> it's like, when will we? Every see- time when someone gets caught, that's what they say. Oh, this is the first time. All my other wins were legitimate. Yeah. Just, to, just not this one. I swear, this was the first time. <laughs> you got me, copper. <laughs> ah, see? <laughs> just so, so ridiculous. Little baggies of white powder falling out of their pants. Like, I don't know where those came from. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, like, I don't know why anyone believes them when they say that. Like, why do you even release those statements? Like, dude, we know you're cheating the whole time. <laughs> when are we going to see the day that someone gets caught and just owns up to it? Yeah, just, it was me. <laughs> just oh, it took you guys long. Yeah, enough. I did it. This tournament gotcha. I won. This tournament That's I won. What I was complaining about this once, like uh, in a group chat. I was like, yeah, it just need like you just needed someone like Burton Cheney to be a heel about it, you know? Like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you suckers! Yeah, what are you gonna do about it? Just push up his glasses, like you finally seen through my plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, if you're cheating at magic, you probably uh, got like. Some issues that prevent you from having a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, maybe. Before we jump into what we're going to talk about today, the moment everyone's been waiting for, we're wrapping up our three-year giveaway. We've announced our winners. If you want to check them out, head over to our Facebook page, the Disorganized Wizard Club Podcast, or our Twitter page, at DWC Podcast One. We've announced the winners there. Congrats to all. Thank you all for everyone who entered and all the nice things you wrote about us. Yeah, it feels really, feels good, really man. Great. Thank you yeah. all for joining the club. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to a lot more. Another a lot more three DWCs. years. And uh, we're, we're going to keep doing giveaways. We love doing them. They're fun. Yeah, I don't know why. It's just fun to give stuff away. Stick around. <laughs> Marcel Moss wrote a whole book about this. It's called The Gift, you know? Okay. Gift Economies and Structures, you know? Hmm. You check it out. So <laughs> there was no big tournaments this past weekend to talk about, but we all played whoa. our... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I played a Wait. Sunday popper event. Whoa, okay, come on. Right. There was the cup Tournament noodle GP. Was huge. <laughs> Did you hear about this? No. And the cup of noodle event. Yeah, it was like no. this like huge tournament in Japan where the first place prize was 360 cups of instant noodles. Lifetime, or not lifetime, year oh. supply of noodles. Of cup noodles. <laughs> a bunch of like Japanese pros were posting about like, oh, I'm going for these cup noodles. <laughs> <laughs> what one? I don't know. I think it was a limited GP. Wow. I didn't actually keep up on it other than seeing that it was happening. Yeah. A couple and friends of ours watched it, though. Who tweeted about uh, that they preferred the other? I think it was Shuhei Nakamura. Maybe it was someone else. But the tweet was in Japanese, but it was short enough that I was like could barely decipher what it was saying. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, yeah, I mean, I like the like chicken noodle kind well enough. I guess I'll go play. I really like the spicy noodles, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was like complaining about the flavor. <laughs> Man, you'd love to see that. Yeah. Cup of noodle tournament. That's amazing. That's we got to organize another tournament here. <laughs> we'll just give away a whole bunch of Mr. Noodles. Yeah, first. we'll give a year supply <laughs> of Mr. Noodles. <laughs> I mean, if you buy them in bulk, it's probably about similar to what we've been doing for giveaways. I don't know. Our last prize was insane. Right, exactly. For the the for the DWC or the DWC organizational or whatever. Yeah, the organizational had oh, really good yeah. prize. This giveaway is really good prize. Like we should be easy to be able to get. Oh yeah, we can get 360, 360 packs packs of noodles, noodles. <laughs> for sure. Shipping them to our winner actually, in Australia is going to be a beating, but <laughs> yeah, that's actually a worse <laughs> prize than what we currently get or what we gave away last time. Uh, what did we give away last time for the organizational? There's for a box and then some shocks and. Uh, some planeswalkers out of each deck. It was like a Teferi, yeah. like Teferi a foil Kefnet. Or yeah, like or a Kefnet and a Gideon. Yeah, a Kefnet and a Gideon. A box. A box yeah. <laughs> like the prize for a free Man, we're t- so, It was a free tournament. We're so generous. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we're Actually, we're, we're planning on hosting another one in September. That's the plan, right? That is the plan. Yep. It's pre-rotation, so it'll be the last big tournament for all of Magic. We should figure that out after we're done done recording, so I can book it off. So you can book it off because yeah. we're ca- we'll cast the whole thing here this time, so I don't do it yeah. at home, right? Yeah, that'll be that's the idea. That was stressful, <laughs> but it was kind of sweet because I could do like winners' interviews and like mm-hmm. you know what I mean. It was kind of cool. Yeah, but we'll figure it out. We'll have another upcoming tournament in September. We'll we'll let you all know after our giveaway here. What the next thing we'll be doing is a the or, second organizational. Yeah, actually sick. Yeah free tournament i'm pretty sure all right so tell me about this popper tournament oh i got stomped <laughs> let me tell you actually i went i got zero wins <laughs> i got a buy i went one three with a buy good old goose egg you know why <laughs> yeah you weren't hung over i was hung yeah. over magic easy game yeah that's actually true i was i had a great night's sleep was excited woke up play popper got smashed <laughs> all my games were close 
So I didn't feel, you know what I mean? Yeah. But more importantly, just didn't care. Had so much fun in all my matches. Got to make like tons of decisions. Games were super interesting and close. Very cool. Like I lost to like, a, have my opponent like last two cards needed to not be exact what they were kind of thing. And they were the times I lost like my matches and one I just like kept a bad hand versus I'm still getting used to London Mull and I kept a bad hand versus burning game three. Like, ah, uh, this is a close, like I might be able to get there. And then I just like instant, he, he killed me on turn three with like fire blast, like bolt, 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 fire blast. I was like, nice. oh, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> like I had to like mull to a hand that has like life gain in it. And I didn't, um, so whatever, but yeah, the decision making was really fun. Like the matches were really close. I think that format's like maybe the funnest format for me right now. It's so thrilling. Okay. I could play it forever. I don't know you why. You can qualify for the pro tour playing popper now. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah. Really? Good old uh, MTGO. They have uh, pro tour qualifiers in popper now. All right. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have like a, door slam yeah. sounds of me stomping out. Yeah, I think they had the... The first one was last week. Wait, so we're allowed to talk about Popper now on the podcast because it's a competitive format. <laughs> well, slow down. Oh, hey, oh, let's go. It is. You Wait, just said it was. Did they... Am I remembering this wrong, but was there a Popper Grand Prix announced or something? Or yeah. No, it was a Popper MCQ at a Grand Prix. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah. yeah they, but they said they're going to start taking Popper more seriously. <laughs> yeah, they made it official and they like... Uh, Made one ban list for both paper and moto recently. Yeah. Good old popper challenge here. First place. What is this? This is what I played basically. Very different, just like Jeskai stuff. Yeah, of note uh, for Arkham's Astrolabe and uh, Ephemerates. Ephemerate. For Ephemerate, for Astrolabe, which are taking really, popper by storm. Yeah, like literally storming too with <laughs> whether the storm in the sideboard. <laughs> Uh, this one doesn't have it in the sideboard, actually. It's got a but it's got a though. main pulse, which is very good. Um, pulse just letting you rebuy our Mancer is uh, insane. So you can just loop. Eventually, you get to a point in this deck where you can just loop everything. Uh, the problem I found is with the fair mid-range like Jeskai decks is you lose to Tron because you can't beat the mana advantage they accrue. Because eventually, they accrue like mystical teachings and everything, and they just play the game that you're trying to play in the late game better. But your early game is better than Tron's because you don't have the same mana problems early. Mm -hmm. This mana base is just so hilarious. Ten islands, one mountain, one plains, one forest, two evolving wilds, four ash barons. Yeah. <laughs> Clean. Yeah. Because you can cycle for the ash, yeah. you gotta cycle the ash barons get your basics. That's yeah. Nice. And as long as you cast your astrolabe, like you're fine. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. Like once astrolabe resolves, you're good to go. Yeah, no, the deck's very good. I did not think astrolabe would be as powerful and ubiquitous as it was when I first read that card. I thought it would be like a one-off thing for like snow decks in that draft archetype. Not well, just everyone only plays snow basics now. Yeah, snow basics are expensive now too. Well, yeah, it, it's just like so much better than all the other, you know, baubles, right? Or like the star in the sphere because you can use its mana filtering all the time instead yeah. of just once. Yeah. Some decks still play both Prophetic Prism or a mix too because they just want to make sure they always have filtering. Like Tron still plays Prism. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because they... They have Tron lands. They have to cast multiple color spells a turn, so they need yeah. more rocks. And they can also cast a Prism on two with like Tron land, Tron land, and they can't cast Arsene Snowlade yeah. or Astrolabe. Yeah. And some other Jeska will play both. I think they'll play the Astrolabe and the Prism. Also, they're, I mean, they're both really good with um, in the Tron deck, though. They're better with Ghostly Flicker because you can flicker them to draw cards. Nice. But more importantly, <laughs> I mean, you can just flicker your Astrolabe in your tower. <laughs> So that it cost you no mana to cast your ghostly flicker? How nuts is that? That's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, dude, how are you not just playing Popper Tron all the time? You're going to have to buy a second set of Tron lands, though. Why? Well, so you can, don't have to unsleep yeah. your deck. Dude, you know how expensive Tron lands are now? Really? Yeah. How much? I don't know, a few, a few dollars a piece or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, <laughs> you know how much I got them for? Like 20 Like cents. nothing. I've yeah. had mine since I was a kid, actually. But you Back already didn't do anything. <laughs> You'd already have to spend that much on a popper mana base because it's all snowlands. Yeah. Snowlands can't be that expensive. They're like three bucks. Well, like a buck a pop, maybe. The new Two, ones are like a dollar each, I think, the yeah. full art. The old oh, ones yeah. are like three or four bucks a pop. Wow. Uh, they're more expensive than Tron lands. Basics. That's what garbage <laughs> Tron is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Cam, how'd you do in popper? Uh, I went 3 1, played mono black, lost to very good draws, 
games two and three from red in the finals. Couldn't quite start casting my like five and six mana life gain spells and just died. <laughs> Classic. Like I could, uh, rats. I cast them game sure. one because he mulled to five. So like his mm. hand was slow enough that I could cast Grey Merchant. And once that hits, you're fine. But yeah, rats indeed. <laughs> yeah, a lot of chittering rats. That card's so nuts. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it was good. Just uh, we were playing. <laughs> We were playing for fun. You time walked me like twice. Yeah. I just didn't have a turn three player to anything to do that turn. Mm-hmm. They just rats me. I'm like, yeah, just drew my card. Go. <laughs> Can't do anything. <laughs> sure. what, what is chittering rats? Uh, three mana, one black, black, two, two, rat. When it enters the battlefield, uh, I think it's an opponent or target player. Puts a card from their hand on top of their library. Yeah. That's a good card. So it's, it's basically just they skip their next draw step. Wow. So if they were stuck, they're stuck for another turn, and you have a 2-2. Two, two. And it's double black to cast it, right? So with Grey Merchant? Yeah, it's yeah. nuts with Grey Merchant. Uh, played the mirror, mono black mirror round one against friend of the show, Curtis. We both were just, like, playing rats. Like, I'd rats him. He'd be like, okay, would untap without drawing, because it's easier than just resolving it. Play a rats. I would untap without drawing. Play a rats. Like, we each just, like, kind of put some rats <laughs> onto the battlefield and then played the rest of the game. <laughs> it's miserable. <laughs> On the of of an important note though, for people interested in playing Popper and playing the either Just Guy or whatever decks, um, but with Ash Barons as well, and Ash Barons Evolving Wilds and the switch to Snow Basics opened up something I think very powerful that people were hesitant to do for a long time in Popper, which is play Brainstorm, because before you played the tapped Gain Life to dual lands, and they're good in Popper because. Just gaining that life actually ended up mattering a lot versus things like Burn, and which is a very popular deck, and like various other aggro decks, um, and made your mana qu- quite good in Popper for triple color. But now with Ash Burns Evolving Wilds, you can play Brainstorm, which is a huge, huge boon to Popper, where previously basically no one could play Brainstorm because there's no shuffle effect. But now that we're basic land cycling and Evolving Wilds, Brainstorm becomes very, very powerful. Hmm. Yeah, old mono blue would sometimes sometimes play one or two brainstorms. Just you know, sometimes it can find you what you need that turn, or it can set up Delver flips. But it wasn't very common, common, and they didn't play that many. But all the blue red Delver lists are up to three or four, and yeah, same Ash Barons and Evolving Wilds and such. Yeah, hmm. it's pretty cool how it changes how the yeah. cards are played. I think it's pretty neat. I mean, Preordain is still kind of king overall. Yeah. Because yeah. Preordain just gives you the best looks at a lot of things early, and it's a safe search early so you think it's better than ponder uh yeah i guess it depends on the deck like whether you want the shuffle or not yeah because you can shuffle your brainstorms with ponder yeah 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 sure can so now ponder is probably better like ponder brainstorm but yeah some decks probably want 10 you know what i mean like they yeah. play like four ponders four like three brainstorm three period or something you know some mix but it changes the blue cantrips and popper which is pretty cool but the takeaway here is that Ephemerate and Astrolabor completely warp the format. Like, Ephemerate is just so obnoxious. I talked about it in the pre-show, but being able to... Because Maul Drifter was always, and I think I'd said this a year or two ago, that Maul Drifter was the king of Popper and had always been and probably will always yeah. be the king of Popper. I don't even play Popper, and I, yeah, I even know that. <laughs> yeah, Maul Drifter is god. Yeah. You know, and now, and now you just... Once you have four mana, you can evoke your Maul Drifter and then Ephemerate it and you draw four. What are they going to have worse? They go, okay, yeah, they kill it, and you're, you know, they fizzle your ephemerate, but, I mean, you still drew two off the evoke. It's not the end of the world. You know what I mean? Like, the, yeah. the, the floor is still pretty high. You're not worried about getting totally blown out. Yeah, it sucks. But if it resolves, it feels like you're just out of one. Hmm. Like two mana draw. And, draw yeah, four. ephemerate, like, a lot of popper is built around just, like, creatures with value ETBs that kind of slowly build up and snowball, and it just lets you repeat all of these. Like, I haven't didn't look too closely at the popper lists, but like spell stutter sprite Adam and I were talking about might make another resurgence one because it counters opposing ephemerates, but also because you can ephemerate yours to counter more spells. Yeah. We were talking about this. I was like, wait, that's so busted. So if you have a double spell stutter sprite or well, or if you're playing, um, fairy miscreants in some, some blue decks play fairy miscreants. There's a new one though, that, uh, fairy seer, which is a same thing, like single blue one, one, but that, ETB scry two. So the first one's yeah. better. Yeah. So with Spell Stutter Sprite, you know, you could counter Astrolabes, which can really shut down, you know, a dex mana completely. Um, and then, yeah, you can ephemerate your own <laughs> Spell Stutter Sprite to accrue value. And as the longer the game goes on, if you have more copies in play, you could just 
theoretically start locking them out of the game. Mm. Yeah. So there's like <laughs> lots of interesting things going on in the format for how to build and design decks. There's so much design space right now. It's kind of in that new phase where like something's been demonstrated as powerful after a banning and with a new set. And it's sort of adapting from there. Oh yeah, I forgot there was a pop for ban, eh? Yeah. Well, they, they, they banned Gush. Days, days Gush, him. Mm. Him, I'm like, meh, whatever. I think or and Sinkhole, right? Uh yeah. I don't know. Sinkhole got axed. Mm. So yeah. I'm probably okay with the days banning. I think it's fine. I don't know. I kind of liked having days in the format, but it does feel bad if you're playing like three and four mana things in Popper that you just kind of expect to resolve and they just get dazed, you know? <laughs> free spells in Popper feels... I feel like just getting anything dazed feels pretty bad. Yeah, but I get, the higher the mana cost, I think Yeah. the more it feels bad. But mm -hmm. yeah, days ban probably pretty good. Yeah, format's like... Pretty, Gush had to go. Gush was really strong. And the fact that it opens up Delver decks and blue decks to other, you know, multiple colors. So you don't don't need all these islands laying around is nice. Gush is, yeah, Gush is probably a little evil, you know, a card too good. Although I guess it would have been even more over the top. Like now the decks are using Astrolabe to fix their mana. They're still playing, like you said, 10 islands. They just would have been gushing also. Yeah, that would have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gush is obnoxious. Although, you know, it's defense. If it, it, It's a non-bow with Spire Golem. Yeah, because it has affinity for islands. You're picking up your islands, so maybe Gush sucks. Yeah, but you can cast your fine. Spire Golem. Yeah, dude, that sounds awful. You yeah, just yeah. cast your Spire Golem first, and, and then, then you pick up, up your islands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm aware. <laughs> Played a lot of that deck. Oh. But anyway, yeah, Popper for anyone listening, yeah, good spot. They have it at hashtag at the tower if you ever... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, is it every Sunday once a, no, once a month? Once a month. Once a month. Um, um, we're trying. I was trying to push them for twice a month because I think it's so much fun, and I would go play more if it was twice a month because it's cool that. But they have monthly popper tournaments, which yeah. is pretty cool. Currently, so. once a month. Wait. Which Sunday it is sort of shifts around, but it's a Sunday once a month. You pay attention to their schedule on their website. Yeah, know. we should be there for the next one. We've been at the last. I've been at the last two. Yeah, come check it out. It's a ton of fun. Maybe we can get up oh. twice a month if we had a popper crew going. Yeah. Get a popper squad. Squad of broke <laughs> squad of broke boys. <laughs> Dude, I was playing all mismatched foil basics too. <laughs> and like a random uh so I had a Japanese seeker of the way. Because that card's a common, by the way. I I know. Now? Because of the It's insane. Dude. <laughs> it's it's a lot for Dude, popper. I yeah. only played three copies. Huge mistake. Should have played four. It's the best card in my in the Jeskai Dex, in my opinion. Yeah, man. I remember casting that card in Limited. It was busted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so easy to cast because you just, you know, yeah. play an Astrolabe, ponder, preordain, <laughs> just to attack you for five life. Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> so obnoxious, man. It's so good. But yeah, I think a random Japanese Seeker of the Way, a foil Seeker of the Way, like just all these <laughs> random sort of just like one foil like preordain, a foil point. Like it was all just foil tranquil cove, like just <laughs> random lands, all foils and stuff. Just looking hideous. Did you play your foil brainstorms? Um I played two and then <laughs> the baller ones. Uh no, not the Mercadian Masks ones. Uh. I played I'm trying to think which ones. Did I want to flex on people? No, but I did play. I did play one beta counterspell. Wow! And then three Ice Age ones. <laughs> <laughs> Outside one beta island, and then just like a bunch of mismatched foil islands. I'm pretty sure it's not a popper deck unless it's an aesthetic train wreck. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Is that the rule for the format? Yeah, that's the only rule. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Cam, you're not playing the MCQ this weekend, right? No, I'm not. No, Adam, you're playing though, right? I believe so. What are you thinking of playing? Uh, Dredgehog, probably. Dredgehog. Dredgehog hack. Yeah. Okay. Probably play some Dredgehog. Because I'm pretty familiar with the deck. I can play some games tomorrow with uh, online. So, mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine sent me like his whole sideboard guide and what matchups should look like what. How do, you know what I mean? Sent yeah. me a lot of info about it. So it's the deck I'm probably going to be the most comfortable with. Sweet. So I'm probably going to play Dredgehog. If I don't play Dredgehog, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say it. Like I'm pro I'll probably play John to Greenback <laughs> and then just be super pissed afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely playing Hogak. I've been playing that deck nonstop for the past week. How? 
What do you mean? How are you not sick of it? Do, uh, just like run it through a league and then you'll, you'll, you'll understand. <laughs> okay. Just like, I don't know. There's something about playing something you know is busted and isn't going to be around forever. Because like you're just doing these ridiculous things you never actually get to do. Mm. You know, and I, that appeals to me. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. It's like yeah. the purge. That's probably, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's what just if like that. For one night, you could cast 2288 eight, <laughs> on turn two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think Dredge Hog is probably also just a fine, like equally or close to enough busted deck. So mm-hmm. I'm just too, also just not in the next few days going to put together the entire Hogak list, whereas I have all the other Dredge stuff. Oh, yeah. Wait, you all had modern cards? Yeah. Whoa. I know. Unbelievable, <laughs> right? I think I own like everything in Dredge just accidentally, you know, from owning other... Yeah. A lot of Dredge is from, like, newer sets. Yeah. But also I used to play a lot of Life from the Loam decks, various Life from the Loam decks, and in Legacy and in Modern, so I just have tons of stuff like that. Yeah. But I played Fair, you know? <laughs> I remember in Modern, I used to play this deck. Uh, dude, it was actually sick. I used to play Seismic Assault, uh, Assault Loam. You remember that deck? Salt Loam, yeah. Yeah, I used to play Salt Loam. The deck wasn't good. That deck is awesome. You take it back. <laughs> you get to play Countryside Crusher. I got huge. <laughs> or as Evan affectionately refers to him as Crunchy Side Cruncher. <laughs> <laughs> Just coming in for the crunch. <laughs> That's great. Dude, that reminds me. So if anyone's looking for like a sweet YouTube channel to binge, I recently discovered a channel called The Craftsman. C-R-A-F-S. Oh, boy. The Craftsman. The Craftsman. Okay. Steady Crafting. And he just does videos where he like builds things out of metal or like makes plaster casts of things. And it's all done in, he just kind of like whispers like that he'll be like yeah and like you want to say and this like really good like just give it a scratchy scratch and then like <laughs> just like about how to i don't know make things out of old keys it's great <laughs> yeah, that's what you reminded me of when you said uh, crunchy side cruncher yeah crunchy side cruncher <laughs> it's a very craftsman thing to say yeah no seismic loam was a terrible deck it's so fair and slow and you're trying to cast a triple red enchantment <laughs> Hope it doesn't get abrupt decayed and then deal two with it and then cast life from the loam and then deal another six the next turn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh my God. That deck was so bad. <laughs> Still better than Aldrazi and Taxes for the record. Dude, you could have been on like a reality TV show, like grad student, uh, not really having any budget, but excited to be a first time loam owner. <laughs> Yeah, that was yeah, that was me when I had life from the lumps for the first time. Yeah, it was yeah. when I was like new to magic. Well, yeah, when I started playing again recently mm-hmm. as an adult kind of thing. But yeah, I just loved loam, you know. Played it in Legacy a lot though. It's a lot better there. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. When you can get back wastelands. Uh yeah, or you know, dark depths. <laughs> dark depths that speed stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one, uh Yeah, the good ones. They're pretty good. <laughs> pretty good, yeah. Better than casting seismic assault, <laughs> yeah. getting them for six. It's like that's the best part. You're like discard a land deal too. You know, it's like got him. I don't think it's too, okay, I'll take I'll take uh, twelve from you two tarmogoyfs. They're six sevens. Like my life in the world. <laughs> Getting back these. Huh. Can only do six. <laughs> yeah, you can only do six. I have to wait. <laughs> it feels bad, man. Yeah. So I don't know what I'd play. Like, what is even in your case? So that, actually taking magic seriously here for a sec. All right. What what are as a Hogak player, what do you what do you not want to play against or what are you worried about? So how do people beat you? I think this is what we should be talking about. The decks that I can lose to. Well, so let's start. The only decks I've lost to are the mirror match, uh red white burn and war prison. Okay. Um war War prison kills you because you if you can't deal with an ensnaring bridge, you just lose on the spot. Um, and I mean, you have a lot of ways to deal with it post board and most Hogak decks are playing trophy in the main deck like I am. So like you have outs to it game one, Okay. but post board game, sometimes you just don't find your, your artifact hate and they can just kill you with a bridge. But, uh, then burn, burn can race you. Right. Um, 
Because, like, even if you do play a turn two Holgak, if you're on the draw, like, Burn can kill you on turn three if they have a good draw. So there's not much you can really do in that aspect. And you don't really have much in the way of interaction. Right. Like, most decks have max four removal spells. Dude, why don't you play Knot of the Bone in the sideboard? The, why not? Uh, no. Why? I don't know. That uh, just seems... That's I'd rather just race them. It's the one where you gain life for creatures in your graveyard? Yeah. Or all graveyards? Yours. Because, like... The little bit that I saw of Hogak play out on coverage, it delves away a lot of its yard and yeah, it brings yeah, back a lot of its gas and venge vines. And so, like, it's left with kind of trash yeah, in its yard. Yeah, like small yard. Yeah. There's got to be a way to gain that, life, though. How much mana does that card cost? Three. Three? That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. Yeah. But there's got to be ways that, like, you can have side. Because, like, if it's one of the only decks you lose to, you should probably have sideboard cards for it. Wait, what's yeah. that uh, one mana gain eight if something died? Uh, Not feed the clan, but that new one. Yeah, I know what you're it's talking about. Like gain three if something died, gain eight, cost one. Are you thinking, is it called Life Goes On? Yes. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Like you're sacking things to your carrion feeders. Mm -hmm. Can you afford the card disadvantage from that though and still win? Probably, right? From the card disadvantage of what? Just gaining life, gain life cards. Because they technically uh, do nothing. So the, like if we're talking about how most lists are built, like they have, there's a core, right? There's the grave crawlers, your Karen feeders, your uh, Seder wayfinders, yeah. your Hogax, your Veg Vines, Bloodgast. And then you have flex slots that are usually, it's usually the same cards that are sideboarded out all the time. So, like, if realistically, if you have those, there's about maybe five, I'd say, like, because there's some matchups where your lightning axes aren't good. And then you have Golgari Thug and Neonate, which can be slotted out. So, like, you, as long as you're not really touching your core, you can you can afford the uh, the disadvantage. Yeah. But I mean, that might be something worth considering, actually, versus burn, because that yeah. would buy you a turn or two. I don't know. I kind of just want cards in my sideboard, though, that are good in multiple matchups and outside of. I, it's just. But if you only have three weak matchups, like, or is are you doing well in other matchups because of your current sideboard? Yeah, I just don't know if that's a better plan. If it's a better plan to just try and straight up race them and just be very consistent with your main game plan. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, the hate they're bringing in is probably a turn two rest in peace, which, like, if they're on the draw, that probably doesn't matter if your deck is just, you know, very locked in on its main game plan. Right? Rest in peace also turns off the extra life on Life Goes On. <laughs> yes, <it laughs> what does. a hate card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I think with the burn matchup, you just straight up want to race them. Yeah, fair. Just be very, you know, clean. Because um, yeah, they're I'm all I'm expecting versus them is them. Maybe they'll bring in a Tormod's Crypt or Crypt or a Rest in Peace. Yeah, yeah. And like what rest, in, rest in Peace too slow, man. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, no, I've I've been it's been too slow in every format for years. Yeah, I think that card's garbage. Yeah, but yeah, those are those are the hard. The hard matchups and the the mirror just feels very swingy. Yeah, that doesn't like, surprise me. I lost to it today because I kept I kept a seven card hand that couldn't deal with a ley line, and then my opponent kept played two. I'm like, <laughs> my hand is so good if my opponent doesn't have a ley line, and they just put two into play on turn zero. Like, well, <laughs> that I'm dead. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's so it's just yeah the burn the mirror prison. What else are there any even other hard matchups even? Um, I'd imagine. In fact, might be a little troublesome. If I don't know. I beat that deck with Tron. <laughs> <laughs> that deck stinks. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, speaking, speaking of Tron too, how, you know, it won two tournaments a couple weekends ago yeah. and has been doing relatively well. I, I, I don't understand how. I haven't played the Tron side yet, but I played the Hogak side multiple times now and it just feels like a buy. Like every single time. I just don't hmm. understand it. Maybe maybe it's because I have like trophies in the main deck, and before a lot of decks didn't. I don't know. It just yeah, that seems like a big game. Playing trophy main seems pretty good. Yeah, it just I don't know. I, yeah, my opponent plays a Tron land. I'm like, sweet, <laughs> got him. Yeah, but you know your enemy. You have insider knowledge yeah, of how to exploit I, Tron players <laughs> that mean, other people can't possibly understand without your experience. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually just a genius. <laughs> Uh, yeah, everybody play Tron this weekend, actually. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> you could go ahead and play some Tron this weekend. 
But yeah, I've I've been having a lot of fun playing Hogak. A hundred percent, something has to be banned. So it's uh, it's time is counting down. But you think so? Yeah. 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 Probably just a for sure ban, right? Yeah. But for sure, playing it this weekend, and you damn right, I'm gonna play it in Richmond as well. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. You think they just ban Hogak? They have to. And like, <laughs> no, I just love the yeah. They have to. <laughs> <laughs> I they mean, have to quote from men playing Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of what. I'm just not sure you, if you could ban anything else in the deck. Right. Yeah, because like you said, there's a lot of slots that you could theoretically replace. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I wonder if. So, if somebody plays Jun this weekend. Do you think they're just trolling? Yeah, I don't know what you're you're thinking if you're playing John this weekend. Yeah, because people just still so play bad. it all the time. It's so bad. Have you played it a lot? Were you just mopping them? Yeah, like I don't understand what it does. Yeah, I assume you just kill run them yeah. over very easily. Yeah, the the matchup isn't close. I don't understand. <laughs> but I'm not understanding either. But it's like <laughs> the third most played deck in modern right now. Yeah, probably got good matches everywhere it's like else. It, it and Tron are like the third most played deck which seems insane to me because i'm like well neither of you probably have a good hogak matchup you just have a good matchup maybe versus other things and tron yeah. has a good matchup versus tron yeah but yeah that that's what it is their their matchups against the field are good but but so is hogak's you know what i mean yeah <laughs> or like how's the phoenix matchup uh that's not a matchup i've actually played I played a bunch of leagues and I have not played as it Phoenix once. Right. Yeah, because that's yeah. like the still a very popular deck. Like it's mm -hmm. the second most popular deck in modern. Yeah. It had, you know, it was the most popular until Hogag. And a lot of the lists I've seen now are playing cards like Vapor Snag in the sideboard or Set Adrift in the main deck. And like Ooh. those are cards that can give you trouble. Yeah, Set Adrift seems sweet. Yeah. Because like, Magmatic Sinkhole does nothing versus you. Right. But Set Adrift bouncing your Hogag, that's a pain in the ass. Yeah, that seems really good. Mm -hmm. Huh. So have you I, played against humans at all? No. What is no, going dude, on? I played against goblins today. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, dude, they got goblin ring later. Uh, he, I won game one very easily. Game two, he like crankoed into, <laughs> he had a war chief in play plus the, what? what's the goblin that gives everything haste and plus one plus one? Oh, I, it's from a corset, right? Yeah, yeah it's the <sighs> rare. I can't Yeah, remember. so he just like made... I don't know, seven yeah, goblins yeah, with sir. haste and like killed me. <laughs> and then I cast a plague engineer and he conceded to it. In game <laughs> <three>. <laughs> right on. But yeah, yeah I've played, I've played some weird decks. Because I feel like but... humans might have an okay matchup depending on how their draw lines up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if their reflector mages line up well, yeah. it could be really good. Yeah. Mm. I, I think I agree with you. Yeah, because if they but... keep you up Hogak for that turn, because you can't cast it from anywhere, right? If they bounce one with mage. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's why. Ooh. Yeah. Like, if they're on the play, I think their matchup's like, okay, on the draw, I feel like they just lose automatically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they get run over. Like, it's too fast. I feel like on the play, if they have a noble hierarch, they they could very easily beat you. If they, I, I think if they don't have acceleration, it might be hard yeah, to Yeah, it'd be tough. So here's a question. Well, they have to have uh, either hierarch or um, vile, right? Mm -hmm. like, and Because the, vile, they might be able to get enough in play in time to survive. Yeah. But if not, yeah, they're dead. And I think on the draw, they actually lose. Right, like I think on the draw, yeah. they just play like something that's too small, and they just get pounded. Yeah, they're playing like a Thalia on turn two, and then that's you, just you played a Hogak and brought back a Vengevine. Like, that's just too slow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Thalia three probably not bad though. Actually, versus you, hey. Yeah, it might not be bad because uh, can block Vengevine, right? Yep. If someone is playing human against Vengevine Hogak, yep. What do you think they should name with their meddling mages? The first meddling mage, uh, what would you least like to have as a Hogak player? I mean, probably just Hogak. Just right? Hogak himself, the, simple, <laughs> the obvious choice? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I don't think anything else is... That's the only card you care about. Yeah, because I guess meddling mage can't turn off Vengevines or blood ghasts, and the rest is kind of small, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, or too other, risky to pick. Yeah, all the other cards you can very easily stonewall, but you can't block an 8-8 with trample. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a few matchups like that I wonder about. Yeah, like how, how it turns out for you. But yeah, the deck just seems like it doesn't have bad matchups. You know what I mean? Which is a sign that probably you're correct. That Yeah, honestly, out of all the decks I've played against, there was nothing where I felt disadvantaged 
ever. Yeah. It's like, yeah, these games are all very winnable. Yeah. Probably yeah. a wise choice then yep. to register that deck. Yeah. But yeah, I'm curious like what they're, yeah, what people think they can beat it with. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm curious what people show up to the MCQ with. Should be interesting. I honestly don't know how big of a percentage in the metagame it's going to be, though, at a smaller tournament like this. At an MCQ, you know? I don't think it'll be that much yeah. just because it's modern, first off. People don't really switch decks that often. Yeah. People are pretty locked in, but they'll show up with a lot of hate. Mm -hmm. But if you're prepared for it with a couple main deck trophies and some sideboard cards, like your only alliance plus um, force, yeah, force of vigor or whatever it is. Yeah, like at a small tournament like this, I'd expect the meta game to be more, you know, evenly distributed, a lot more flat. Yeah. You know, everything is kind of around nine, ten percent. I would be tempted to put together the um, prison deck, but I just don't. I feel like I would just throw constantly. Like I would just be. That deck's really good. I think it's, it's insane. Really, really good. The problem is that I just have zero practice with it, but I love prison decks, and I think I play prison decks. Um, they're like my strong my strong suit but mm -hmm. yeah that deck i feel like i'd want to get a lot of reps in for how i want to play it so i don't know if i'd get it together in time plus i actually don't own mox opals i own every other thing in the deck i think well i don't own urzas but i just buy them so opals still pricey oh yeah it's gotta be right oh yeah yeah opals are like over 100 canadian wow. yeah that's a lot of money for yeah, a everything spell. El everything else <laughs> in the deck is cheap cheapish besides like i think urzas like a bit, but not bad. Yeah, I think Urza is kind of expensive, but everything else is like yeah, welding, yeah. welding I, jars. Bridges are like 50 bucks maybe or something like the 60, yeah. or something like that, but they're not bad. I own them, so I don't, you know what I mean? Like I own everything else. I own all the lands, I own all the, and all the small artifact pieces I don't randomly own are like a couple bucks. Yeah. But, I mean, I could borrow opals from people. That's not an issue. Like I could borrow mox opals. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I feel like that deck requires a lot of reps though you know like because it's a deck with any piving needle a prison style deck you need to know the meta like if it was legacy i could play that deck and do well but i don't know modern well enough for prison decks for how i'm supposed to play them whereas in legacy i do and i'd be fine so i feel like i would just screw up you know what i mean like yeah. i would just mess up way too much and i'd be so like mad at myself for it whereas dredge I'm, like that deck pretty just great. put whole gags in the play man. that's what i'm saying they dude. won't let you plus down. dredge is actually just a brain dead deck yeah, exactly. Yeah, actually, like you, you just dredge. Yeah. <laughs> like, Am I gonna draw this turn? Nope. No. I'm gonna, like, <laughs> can I dredge? Okay, I'll dredge. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta remember your triggers. But I mean, yeah. Well, you gotta target lands with loam. Plus, you that have an hard. okay burn matchup. You know, fixes the Hogak burn matchup. You got lightning helixes. That's oh, true. Yeah. Free helixes. Yeah. yeah. So hold up a protest sign. <laughs> Free helix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'll figure out what I'm going to play. Just promise me you won't let me register green black. Because, <laughs> like, part of me wants to so bad. You have no idea how much I wanted to register green black. Don't. Don't do it. Unless it's green black Hogak. Green black with tireless <laughs> trackers. Four tireless trackers, Yikes, dude. Man. Yikes. Yeah. Turn three, Yikes. do nothing. No ETV effect. That's the magic I came to play. But, like, why? Three mana, you... three, two, chump block. <laughs> chump block takes six. <laughs> chump block takes six. Chump don't just trade with your, your like, blood cast or great crawler. <laughs> why would you want to play tracker without Ren and six? Because uh, I think red is not necessary. But Ren isn't red. Yeah, but Ren and six is so nuts. Why don't you just play green, red, pawn? So. Oh, that is oh, yeah, <laughs> that is tempting actually I, oh man <laughs> maybe i'll just go pawns of people i have that deck together actually not only do i yeah oh yeah i just had to put in sleeves it's all all the cards for pawns are just sitting there even <laughs> including my four storm breath dragons ready to go <laughs> baby <laughs> how you gonna path to exile me huh okay nothing kills that guy <laughs> no removal of modern kills that guy you're right what are you gonna do bolt them Cost he has four toughness. When you fail push him, cost five. <laughs> Can't even revolt. It's nuts. <laughs> it's actually so funny because every removal spell Hogak plays kills it. Lightning axe trophy. Yeah, those kill it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those well actually not if I monster it. Okay. In response to the lightning axe. I just need give me how, give me a minute. Wait till my big brother wait. seven mana shows up. How much mana do you have? <laughs> yeah. wait, I'm gonna direct well, the question back any. to you. Yeah, exactly. What are you casting this trophy with? You got no lands. Yeah, pound it all your lands. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> but uh okay, I will say they I think 
the Jun builds are bad. Like, so one of the guys at the PT only played one Bloodbraid Elf, which I liked a lot, or sorry, the MC, which I liked a lot, because I think Bloodbraid Elf's actually trash. Because, um, boy, does it look bad in the face of Teferi, which we talked about. Um, also, I just don't think it's enough, like, for four mana. I'd rather just play Trackers. And I also think that if you're going to play Red in six, I think it should be the only red card in your deck. And otherwise, you're playing the old green-black shell of Field of Rune. So you actually have a chance to beat Tron. Because green black deck, as you know, like actually has an oak, not good, but it can win versus Tron. Yeah, whereas Jun can't. Yeah. You have more game than than Jun does. Yeah. For sure, yeah. And so I think it should just be like green black splashing red and six is what I think the mid range deck should be doing. Because I think Bolt is like, do you care about Bolt as a Hogak player? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> is this a trick question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I just don't think the red cards give you anything. Like I just don't think Blood Red Elf is enough. Mm -hmm. So. But yeah, I, I mean, think people just got blinded by like Jund was a deck and they want to play a green red card with their black spells. So they just default to Jund. Yeah, I think that's what happens. But I think eventually, like, you'll probably see more streamlined versions of just green, black, splashing, red, and six for field of runes to lock people out of the games, which seems really strong. Like, that seems reasonable. I don't mean now. I mean, when Hogak is banned. Yeah. I mean, in the future, when like Tron is back on top with like various like blue white decks, humans. I think green, black is just better than Jund there, but that's in. A few weeks, right? August twenty second, when Hulk expand. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they let it go, dude? Honestly, I don't care if they do or not. I just, just keep, keep playing. playing I just keep playing. Yeah. I could see them hitting looting and not Hogak. Trying still trying to dance around the issue, dude. That would do nothing. Right, but I could see them doing it, thinking looting matters. Yeah. Yeah, you would cripple a bunch of other decks, and then like Hogak just starts being Saltai, and you just play oh. Hedron Crab and like. <laughs> Before we move off of talking about Modern, though, I wanted to say, so Phil messaged me saying that, yeah, the reason I hated Mono Red Phoenix so much was because I was dumb and playing Phoenix. He's like, see, that's the problem. He's like, just, have you seen the, you know, the versions that just don't play Phoenix anymore? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he was like, I've been playing it. They're way better. Yeah, Mono Red Prowess. Yeah, he's like, just yeah. play Mono Red Prowess. It's actually really good. And I was like, okay, that'll buy. Because my only complaint all the whole time with that deck was, how do you get the Phoenix in the graveyard? Like, you just have to be the luckiest person in the world. You can't. The you deck's just, good draws were when it had a lot of prowess creatures, mm -hmm. like on coverage and stuff, that's how it stomped the games I saw it win. So, Well, yeah, and Bedlam Reveler, ever heard of it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that guy's nuts. <laughs> that one's easy to cast. Yeah. That so, card also has prowess, too. Yeah, just theme prowess. So that I'll accept if people want to play that deck. I mean, you probably still lose to Hogak with that deck, but... Yeah, but yeah, actually, like... You could probably race it. If they ban Faithless Maybe. Looting, your Hogak just becomes a Sultai deck. Your Hedron Crabs replace your Faithless Lootings. Oh, uh, yeah. You play Golgari Thugs instead of Neonates. And then okay, so? You still kill right, people. Yeah. Like, your best draws, the best draws with my deck are turn one Stitcher Supplier, turn two Seder Wayfinder, cast Hogak, and bring back Avenge Vine. Well, it's easy. You just ban Faithless Looting and Hedron Crab. <laughs> <laughs> and but like, what about Mill? Uh, oh, yeah. They can play it. No one else. And, I mean... There's definitely better draws you can have with a turn with a Hedron Crab instead of that, right? So, yeah, yeah I get. I, get I don't. It. I don't think banning looting does anything. I think they should still ban it, but hey, just for dredge. Too. Honestly, I I kind of hope they do because then I still get to play. Okay. No, I think they'll ban Hogak on top of that. Yeah. But, well, yeah. Well, I mean, we'll see. Yeah. I still until then cross for the sweeping bans yeah. I was asking for, but yeah. Like, don't don't, don't get me wrong, everybody. Hogak needs to be banned. <laughs> but I'm 100% going to keep playing it if they don't ban it. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? Using banding? all zones. <laughs> Go for man ban. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, well, we didn't touch on standard, but we can save that for now, next week. Yeah. We've this got, is sort of a broad, yeah, we've just been all over the map yeah. here, but we got to talk about M20 Limited because usually every every set we we get to a, a whole dedicated limited episode and we didn't get around to it for war of the spark um because we were in revolt yeah that <laughs> i didn't want to talk about that format we collectively decided to ban that format also we had some friends playing at the mc and i think i think at that one right and but there was no limited portion or something well like, no there was it was just a pre-release oh that's what it was right so we couldn't set up a limited in time yeah. and stuff like that yeah, yeah it was an arena mc right that's what it was mm, no, no 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 but no. it was the pre-release that weekend oh, so we yeah, had, right we had no experience with it it was mc london remember yeah right, it was the yeah, first day oh yeah we hadn't tried it and then and it was modern yeah. and mc yeah because yeah, ben was there and he's asking us and we were like yeah we don't 
sorry, we just haven't played it yet because it's a pre-release. Mm -hmm. But usually we like to spend some time doing a limited episode, but we skip War of the Spark because um, I think collectively all three of us just absolutely despise that format. I played zero games of that format. How lucky. Yeah, how lucky. On yeah. purpose. Yeah, yeah. Also played zero games of this format, so you guys are going to take the lead on this one. Yeah, well, this format's great. <laughs> War of the Spark was a complete disaster. I played so many matches of it, and I absolutely loathe that format. It's this maybe the worst limited format in the last four or five years, I think. Wow. I think it's, it's worse than Battle for Zendikar. Really bad. Wow. Which is... That's... That's... A big criticism because yeah. Battle was unbelievably bad. That was horrendous. And I think War is worse. I played a lot of that limited format. It was bad. It was atrocious. That whole block was bad. Like, um, what was it? Battle for Zendikar and Oath? Yeah. Oath was also horrible. And then every other limited format around that's been great, basically. They were all, like, really good for the most part. Uh, M19 was, like, not great, but it was okay. Ixalan was mediocre. Well, there's a bit of a low uh, point. Come on. I got the merfolk people. <laughs> Slippery fish. It was a bit of a low point, but not nearly as bad as War of the yeah, Spark. Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say it was bad. It wasn't great. The problem was that River Herald's boon and, like, right, was too good. But yeah, well, the problem was 99% of the cards in this set sucked. And then the other 1% was, was, was like just so <laughs> unbelievably good because everything else sucked. Yeah. yeah. But in M20, you'll, our dear listeners will be happy to hear that every card sucks. <laughs> and this is a good thing. Yeah. Wow. Sure, there are bomb rares, whatever. We're not going to talk about those today because talking about rares and mythics is stupid because they don't matter in draft. Like in constructing your draft or your sealed deck in a realistic way. However, all the commons and uncommons are kind of bad. And that's a good thing because the format, in my opinion, to do well requires you to build your deck in a synergy-focused way that can compete with other decks. You can't just take good cards. This isn't a five-color pile format. You can't just take five-color good stuff. You will lose. Yeah, there I tried it once. Yeah, they're just... Like immediately lost. Yeah, they're just... There are no good cards, so you you can't five color pile when there are no good cards to put in your pile. No. This is an actually a really good way to design limited for a core set too. It's great. Like forced deck building around synergies rather than just, you know, your bomb rares. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the key, I think, when you're drafting or building your deck is to really look for these sort of like minor one, two uh, builds of cards that, you know, minor commons and uncommons that really pair well together. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about them first before we talk about archetypes because they'll yeah, feed into yeah. archetypes. That's really something, as you mentioned, like sort of the gauge I've had on how well my decks are going to be before I've played them in this format is exactly that. Like how many pairs of cards can I point to in my deck that have a synergy together? Even if it's kind of a little synergy, just that work together in some way. If I have three of those pairs, deck's probably going to be fine. If there's four or five, I'm probably going to smash everyone. If there's one, well, I hope I draw it because I'm going to be behind in games otherwise. It's really just drafting around putting together these little combos. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I'll start with one that I think is just a funny example. So normally, um, in a limited format, in any other kind of sort of normal, what you, what you perceive to be a normal limited format, would you play um, a one-mana, one-one, tap it to gain one? Hell no. no. <laughs> Not in a million years, right? Never. Soul Mender, you wouldn't play this card. Nope. Just a one mana, one one, tab it, gain one life. You know, you don't have to pay an activation cost, I guess. So. Ban <laughs> mana mechanics. <laughs> 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 but it's pretty it's pretty bad on its own. I think in most in most limited formats, this is just an unplayable card. However, I think in this format, this card is actually quite good for a few reasons. It pairs with um Epicure of Blood. Uh, for example, to, you know, gain a life and they lose a life, which in board stalls in something like Black White Life Gain can be very good or Bloodthirsty Area List where every time you gain life, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it or the three mana 2-2 two, two Angel that every time you would gain a life, you gain double that. Um, There's a 2-2 two, two Angel that if you're at 25 or more, it's a 4-4. Four, four. That's that one, yeah. And oh, it also gains oh, double. It's it self-enabling, yeah, that oh, thing's wow. awesome. And so, yeah, there's just these weird sort of one, two combos that make otherwise sort of medium cards actually quite powerful. And when they're combined together, that they become more than the sum of their parts mm -hmm. because the sum of their parts is not great. But yeah. I think a good example of this, I had a pre-release that I played of this format where I got absolutely smashed playing. Like I got tricked 
because I hadn't played onto the format. I had some good green and red rares, but didn't realize how bad my green and red commons would be in the format. So I was playing, in particular for this example, uh, it's Greenwood Sentinel, the 2-4. Mm-hmm. No, the 2-2 two, two Vigilance. Oh, yeah, that two. just does nothing. Right, so it's just a 2-2 two, two with a keyword, and it was unplayably bad. 2-2 two, two for 2 Vigilance. I don't think there's a point in this format where that card is good or you actively want to play this card. You should never, ever be in your deck. Right, but... To contrast, Blood Burglar is also a two mana two two with a keyword. Also, probably shouldn't be in your deck, but Lifelink has a lot of synergies, and so this card becomes acceptable in decks that can exploit the Lifelink. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it saves this card because <coughs> they're both just bears with a keyword. Yeah, they're pretty bad, but being able to combine it with all these different things. So we're going to talk about some of the different one two punches that you can come up with, and thinking about building your draft deck and how to sort of organize in this limited format. Cause I, I think it's actually a lot of fun. And it, I think to me, it makes the drafting of it a lot of fun because you do get to make these decisions that I think are actually really impactful in the gameplay. So it's mm-hmm. very rewarding to perform the act of drafting. M20. Yeah. The, dra- the act of draft is really rewarding. And that even just the gameplay itself, like um, saving sort of your better card so that they can play removal on a worse creature because you need that card to come up with something you're planning to draw. Like it, builds pulling these combos off builds into also how you play the play out the matches yeah definitely so one, one of the number one i think cards though in the format for commons that's just <laughs> absolutely insane is uh goblin smuggler i think we're in agreement on this one right this guy does a lot more damage than you would expect by the text on the card <laughs> if you told me that you were gonna rate a uh, three mana two two haste as a one of the better commons top tier set. common as a top i think it's a top tier i think it's actually one of the best oh yeah commons in the set which is insanity so it's three mana two two haste in red it's goblin but it also can tap and another target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn so it can do this immediately because it has haste and notably the sort of second part the two of this punch there are many many creatures in this format that sitting around have two or less power and then in combat or when you put mana into them get a lot more power yeah so it's a way to cheat through a lot of damage with this card actually so even something as as bad quote unquote is uh you know scorch spitter the one mana one one when it attacks deals one damage you get yeah. to keep it alive and just always deal two but more importantly in something like green red elementals lavakin you know pumping up a lavakin brawler right because lavakin brawler is the four mana two four whenever lavakin brawler attacks it gets plus one plus oh for each elemental you control so but it's a two four so you can activate you know your goblin smuggler make them unblockable and actually attack for six yeah unblockable this is a very threatening combo that's easy to pull off like lavakin brawler is another top tier common if you have any inkling that you're going to go into elementals take this card very highly it's very good um, but goblins, there's a bunch of other things that Goblin Smuggler works very well with. Uh, sort of a lesser example of Lavakin Brawler is Pack Mastiff. That's what it's called, right? The two mana two two that you can pay two and it has yeah yeah give it plus one plus zero. It. Right, so you pump you give this unblockable attack and then dump your mana into it as yeah. a late game mana sink. Uh, it gets the red one you just passed. Yeah, it gets um, things like Audacious Thief, which you really want to attack but isn't big enough to survive combat normally safely past blockers. So you can keep drawing cards. Yeah, Audacious Thief plus Smuggler is actually insane. Yes. If you have a, a three mana two two that just draws a card every time it attacks, it's wild, unblockable. Yeah, it's a big one. So yeah, that's sort of the most flexible sort of first part of a combo, I think. I mean, even just pairing it with the the pump spell. Yeah, that too, just giving something unblockable and then pumping with growth cycles or infuriates or whatever else you have in attacking. Yeah, there's a lot of ways in this format actually to pump spell cheese someone out of a game. You can actually cheese somebody out with uh, like Uncaged Fury and you know other spells and make something unblockable and then just cheese them out. Might yeah. of the masses. There's lots of really cheesy ways to get kills. Um, so yeah, Goblin Smuggler, one of the better ones. Obviously, we mentioned the things to go with. Um, another one we had on there was like Portal of, of Sanctuary, I think is actually a really insane card in this format. Yeah, so Portal of Sanctuary, it... I talked about this when uh, I discussed my pre-releases in a previous episode. It reads a bit narrow, and it kind of is. So you, again, it's why it's part of this sort of synergy combo. You have to draft your deck in such a way that you can take advantage of this effect. The three-mana artifact 
for which you pay one and tap it, and you return target creature you control and every aura attached to it to uh, your hand, and you can only activate this ability on your turn. So this is very good in sort of these blue-based tempo strategies for picking up ETB creatures, picking up Cloud Conseers to draw more cards, uh, but maybe even more impactfully picking up things like Frost Links to continue to remove blockers from combat. Um, yeah, well, one of the one of the archetypes that this would fit into, in my opinion, and where it's performed really strongly as well, is just Green Blue Elementals, where you have things like Risen Reef and Frost Links, which are both elementals that have ETB triggers, and you can really start to accrue an insane amount of, amount of value because games go long in M20. Yeah. You know, um, unless you... You know, someone not draws you with a red white red white aggro deck because that deck is kind of obvious and kind of mm -hmm. you know very good. But we're not going to waste our time talking about this because it's pretty obvious how it's built. But yeah, the Portal Sanctuary Elementals deck is good, or in blue white blue white it can be very good. Yeah, it's good in it's even good in in. I think it's like for most blue decks, like blue red Elementals too. Like if you have Scampering Scorchers, yeah, you can just keep picking up your one one and playing it to make more tokens. Yeah, giving and they all have haste, right? So yeah, you can pick up your. Uh, Ferocious pups, because the zero one's not doing anything. You pick up that part, you just keep making two twos. Yeah. It's hardly flexible. Yeah, it's a lot of mana, but once you get it in play, it's cheap to activate it. It's not bad. Yeah, it's a good late game engine. Yeah, definitely a good late game engine. Um, so that's another sort of one that combos with a broad number of cards, kind of like Smuggler does. Yeah. There's uh, also the the mono red combo, right? Scorch Spitter and Chandra Spitfire. Yeah, this is another one that, uh, so a friend of ours, a couple friends of ours actually, I think we're at GP Denver. They were at some GP, Detroit, something like this. And they started drafting mono red. I think one guy got forced into it in a draft, a side draft, and then it did very, very well. And so then they all forced mono red in the next few drafts they did, and they all did very well. And so they were convinced briefly that mono red was the truth of the format. <laughs> so it is actually good. It is good. And one of the reasons is that Scorch Spitter, which, as we said, like a one-mana one-one usually isn't good enough. But because it has elemental synergies or can combo with some other things, can push it out, can make it good enough. Chandra Spitfire is a three mana elemental. It's a one three with flying. Uh, but when your opponent is dealt non combat damage, it gets plus three plus oh. So if these two attack together, the Scorch Spitter will do one non combat damage from its trigger and make this thing a four three. And a three mana four three flyer is very, very good. It's worth having a Scorch Spitter around. A three mana four three flyer is actually insane. Yes. And then it just takes a shock and a pump spell to kill them. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah, it's very scary. And also, um, it's kind of one of the things we had a, on a on our notes to talk about was with uh, Diamond Knight. You know, decks like this become actually quite strong. Yeah, that's another sort of synergy that you can keep in mind if you happen to pick up some Diamond Knights early. Most of the monocolor strategies in this format are serviceable, and if they're rewarding a Diamond Knight getting huge, it's Probably worth it. Yeah, you need a couple Diamond Knights, I feel like, to make it pay off. And you can still play a second color just as almost a splash, you know? You don't have as many cards. I've done that quite successfully a few times in Black-White Life Gain where I probably had 18 black cards, and, you know, and then like two or three Soul Menders and one other white card, you know what I mean? And my Diamond Knight was always huge. It was like a 7-7 seven, seven constantly and just ending the game. Yeah, that too. Diamond Knight and an influx of cards in one color is very strong. Yeah, so that's pretty good. Um, I think it's like a pretty pretty strong approach to playing the format for the monocolor structure also as i think in this format you can get away with playing the 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 one of cards like the undead servant a bunch of yeah. undead servants have been really good the four mana three two that when it enters the battlefield you make a two two zombie for each copy of undead servant in your graveyard i played a black white life game deck with five that's many let me tell you when you play the third one <laughs> making two you know a four mana three two that comes with two two twos is bonkers in limited and it only gets crazier i also think the mono blue diamond knight deck the mono blue mill deck with as many sage road denizens as possible yes. is actually insane the clock if you have a lot of sage road denizens it becomes too quick you're yep. milling like six to eight per turn yeah you mill six to eight per turn They're, the game's over very very quickly um and nobody takes sage road denizens i think people should think of sage road denizen as the uh last as the blue card in that cycle with undead servant and growth cycle you should think of Sage Denison as completing it and not Fairy Miscreant, because Fairy Miscreant probably isn't worth it unless you have other cards to support a flying archetype. Yeah, but you can definitely mono blue mill people out with this oh, yeah. card. It's really obnoxious. It's actually surprising. And um, not a lot of people take these because they're bad. Yeah, one doesn't do anything. Yeah. You kind of have to go in on it. 
But if you go in, it is actually quite shocking um, how much you can get people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one of the other uh, things I wanted to talk about was, uh, yeah, a card I was really impressed by, which was Gauntlets of Light. I was uh, really, really shocked by the amount of damage this card can deal. It's another one of those cards that I sort of read and dismissed until an opponent hit me with it. Yeah, when somebody plays a, a Sentinel Griffin, yeah, three mana, one, three, Flying Vigilance, complete trash on its own. Mm -hmm. You put a Gauntlets of Light on it, now we're dealing with a 2-5 Flying Vigilance that deals 5 as its combat damage. Yeah, Gauntlets of Light is the 3-mana enchantment. Plus 0, plus 2. Uh, you deal damage according to your toughness, and it has like an untapped clause for 3-mana. Yeah, and you can untap a creature. It's actually really strong. Yeah. If you can protect this creature, but even if you can, I mean, we're basically making a... We're suiting up the old Bane Slayer and Limited real quick here. You know That's extremely powerful in this format. Yeah. Like a 5-damage... Five, a five damage, It's basically a 5-5 a five, five. Yeah. Vigilance Flyer. That's... Actually insane because air elemental in this format is a bomb. Yes, like a stone cold bomb, and that thing's a five mana four four. That's it. Just boreal elemental is almost even a bomb. Yeah, boreal elemental is also very good. But yeah, gauntlets of light. Uh, you know what's why it's better than a five five? You can still goblin smuggler it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. You can goblin smuggler your sentinel griffin. That's a two five that does five damage. That'll yeah. do five damage. <laughs> Yeah, that is a wombo combo. So we're just trying to set you guys up with some of the one-two punches here. Yeah, another one, um, Woodland Champion. I was really impressed with this card in decks that can support it. It's another one of these two-mana two-twos with kind of a keyword. Bad in a lot of scenarios. Um, but for your green two-two, it gets a plus one, plus one counter every time you make a token. So if you're going in with this card and ferocious pups and maybe if you're in red playing scampering scorchers or really ferocious pup is sort of the combo card because it's green any deck that has this card can have ferocious pups yeah and it, it can really get out of control right like bark hide troll is already good as a two mana three three like you just need one trigger for this to be an acceptable card a two mana three three is big two mana three three is huge yes and then we're talking about if we also have raise the alarms like if we're playing green white tokens oh yeah this thing is out of control I think the best decks we're talking about actually are probably the ones that are Bloodthirsty Aerialist plus a Soul Mender or Woodland Champion plus Raise the Alarm and Ferocious Pops. Those are the decks that can just go completely berserk. Mm -hmm. Those are the, and to me, and play, having played this format, those are the scariest decks. And they're also, there's like something that you'll notice when you pull these combos off is that even though they're sort of early game combos, they incidentally make your late game stronger because your opponent has to use premium removal spells on something you did early. Right. And then now when you draw your, you know, four, four right. power, five power guys later, they don't die. Which, whereas if your early game doesn't have something synergistic like this, they can ignore it and combat it with their medium creatures. And then they have removal for your big guys and then the game's a lot harder. So that's another reason, like, why it's so rewarding to pull these off. Yeah. Um, what are some other combos we have here? Metropolis Sprite and Glaring Aegis, or just really Metropolis Sprite and anything that gives it toughness because... Like gauntlets are fine. Yeah. Gauntlets fine too. Even just normal pump spells. Um, it can be a lot of surprise damage if you have extra blue mana up. Giving this extra toughness actually gives it extra power because of its shift ability. Yeah. So it can very quickly convert things that don't look like they should be damaged into damage. And it's also just a fine two drop on its own. Yeah, I mean, one of the best ones too is just Gauntlets of Light plus Fencing Ace. Yeah, Fencing Ace and... <laughs> Uh, or a fencing ace maniacal rage. That's like a tried and true combo. Oh yeah, vulnerable that's to old... removal. But if they don't have it, yeah, yeah. I think in this format you should play like they don't have it a lot. But yeah. another one that I want to talk about, which sounds sort of silly at first, is uh, renowned weapon smith. Yes, it's a one-two combo with the cards on its <laughs> that it has text for it. That like yeah, you can go get violent. Oh fire. wow, I you can go, go get, get hard cards. It kind of is the one that tells you what to do. But the secondary combo that I was more impressed with is if you have weapon smiths, if you took them early, you can now value stone golems and anvil rot raptors much more highly than other people will. Other people probably won't take stone golem very much. Yeah, but nobody's... you can if you have weapon smiths because now you're paying. Like you can cast it on turn three, three mana four fours. You can cast your. Anvil Rot Raptors and hold up something else to do. Like it taps for two mana for artifacts. That's a lot. Yeah. I think you can build your whole deck around it, actually. I yeah. think if you can take it early and if you have two or three copies of it, your deck's actually insane because no one will take Stone Golem. 
Yeah, that card is unplayable. It's just a five mana four four, just artifact. Yeah, actually unplayable. But if you have renowned weaponsmiths, that card is bananas. Like if if somebody plays it in limited a uh, four four on turn three against me, I I'm pretty sure I'm losing that game. Yeah, you're gonna get hit a bunch by it before you can set up something that. What are you like? What f even on turn four? What are you playing that? You're hoping yeah. what? Are you, what is trading with that? Almost nothing. Yarok Wave Crasher and that's probably it. Right, nothing's getting. You know what I mean? Nothing's yeah, stopping a things, that, but not at all. Yeah, not at a mana advantage. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So you know, and if they have a bunch, and it's just some junky common, you know. <laughs> Anvil Rot Raptor. I've also been really impressed with. Um, for sort of something that I'm going to mention here, but it's right at that sweet spot, like two power first strike. Stone walls, a surprising amount of this format. A lot of important cards are two power, or sorry, two toughness. Yeah, that's why shock is like. That's why shock is very, very good. It's why disfigure is very good. It's why I think uncommon Chandra is just bananas. Yeah, card. She nuts. always kills two important things and sticks around. Um. So yeah, Envil Rot Raptor, I think is very, very good. Well, I don't know. I don't know about very good. Well, I mean, I'm until it gets heart piercer bow. Right. Exactly. I'm happy to play it when it has that one glaring weakness with the heart piercer bow. And that's the other thing I guess I'd say is like if some heart piercer bows are coming around late and you can pick up two, even better if you have a weaponsmith, like there are a lot of decks that just having two bows will lock them out of the game. Yeah, if you get two, I think playing one is pretty medium, but if you get two, it's very good. If you have one, I would keep it in your sideboard because if you play against like if other people are trying to do Scorch Spitter, Cloud Conceer, Fairy Miscreant, like Fencing Ace, like these sort of things, there are a lot of decks that just have a bunch of one ones. And a bow is fine to have access to. But yeah, double double bow is wild. Double bow can just... I've had games where my opponent double bows and everything, I, I have frost lynxes and X1s and like I just can't play anything. They all die. Yeah. Everything in this format is so weak that Vile with Dragonfire is actually playable. Yeah, if, you need, if you're low on removal. You can play that card. Yeah. Because two damage is a lot in this format, which is just bonkers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's like different archetypes for that kind of help you set up these combos, and we'll talk about, you know, what can go in them if you're sort of new to M20 or just looking to grind some gems or gold or stomp at your local LGS. But blue white flyers, I think, is probably one of the obvious ones. Yeah, just your good tempo racing in the air deck. Um, this is like places where fairy miscreant is probably fine if you have like Imperial Eagle is an all-star like I mean, it's the number one card it's the number one type. card if you see an imperial eagle you can just go for this if you are into blue white and you're hoping for an imperial eagle, well i'll pray for you because if you get it your deck's gonna be nuts yeah and it just like it increased your clock so much but yeah because you're just sort of this racing deck you want things like aerial assault is actually nuts it's not great in a lot of other white decks because it suffers this problem where if you're coming up the ground your opponent won't attack and if they don't attack then you can't use your removal spell but if you're attacking in the air and racing, they will be attacking you back. They will have a tap creature, and you can kill it and gain life, which helps you win the race. Yeah, because normally ground creatures are bigger because, you know, as punishment for having flying, they've been shrunk. Yeah. So, you know, they don't block. Flying creatures famously don't block very well. And area assault being a sorcery is just horrendous as removal for most other decks. But for blue eye flyers, it's incredible. Uh, other cards are obviously like winged words, you know discount med ban mana advantage yeah <laughs> uh winged words just a divination but with upside here which is very good in the you know flyers deck cloud can seer which is just a uh all star yeah just, an unbelievably obnoxious card it's so good i was actually talking to a couple people because this card is close enough to phyrexian rager that i was and i had popper on the mind because i'd played that i was wondering if this had a spot they pointed out that phyrexian rage is probably only good enough because it's black and blue has better cards but yeah yeah, and then, you know, cards like Loyal Pegasus. Herald of the Sun is actually a big bomb for your late game if you're trying to go late, which is a six mana 4-4, four, four, and you can activate it for four to put a plus one, plus one counter on another creature, which... Um, another creature with flying. Another creature It'll with It'll be flying. all your deck, hopefully. Um, this card is sort of one of your big late game bombs that you can go for. Again, we're avoiding, you know, rares and mythics mm -hmm. that would, could go in your blue white flyer stack, but these are sort of general cards. I'm sure we're missing a few, too. Like Spectral Sailor is just a god to your card in this format for oh, blue. Yeah. This, you know... It's but unbelievable. It's just good everywhere. It's just an insane card. Like if the board does get gummed up, you're going to win if your Spectral Sailor lives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, notably, I wasn't super impressed by Warden of the Evo Sal whenever I'd had it. The discount didn't seem to matter that much because mostly I found all my flyers were cheap anyway. <laughs> Unless like Warden of Evo Sal, you could 
But there were occasions where it was good when yeah. I was casting the angels. So yeah, the five mana angel, many... the three two that gains five three gains it gains life gains four or something gains four. If you have a lot of those or a lot of these bigger end flyers, but a lot of boreal elementals, air elementals, then this thing could be nuts. Yeah, it can be. It can be definitely nuts. So there are two different ways you can construct your blue eye flyers deck. So just sort of pay attention to how you're doing it. As far as just early, the, all the one mana, you know, trying to swarm, yeah. or you have a little bigger flyers. But that's and one I guess of the... one of the traps of this archetype, because you're trying to race, but your creatures are a bit smaller. I found that blue white in this format also doesn't have uh, its good removal spells aren't as abundant in packs, and so it's very easy to like get an Empyrean Eagle early and taking what you think are good flyers, and removal never really comes around, and you just end up with a way that if you don't get a fast start or even sometimes if you do and they have a removal spell, you can't deal with their threats. So like, but your pacifisms are very, very key. Your aerial assaults are very, very key. And like, they're better than most flyers is to just get some removal in your deck. Yeah, pacifism in this deck better than most others because as games go on long, there are ways out of pacifism throughout this format. But Blue Eye Flyers doesn't really care about that. They just need to turn the tempo in their favor. So it's very good there. Same with aerial assault. Um, so, yeah, worry about getting the flyers after still prioritize removal here. Yeah. Um, an archetype that you have been championing a lot and playing a bunch of. I have, actually haven't drafted this one, but Black White Life Gain has been a pet of yours in this format, Adam. I'm a big fan. I think it's very good. I think because everything is so junky that gaining life actually matters, <laughs> which is sort of ridiculous to say, but um, nobody really takes Epicure Blood. Um, but actually, reason they don't pick Stone Golem, right? If you're not doing anything else with it, it's just a five mana four four, right? Which is just not good enough mm -hmm. because this just does really nothing. Although a four four body in this format actually secretly the key number uh, four four power four toughness is sort of the ceiling almost in this format. It's a lot of removal that does two, a number that does three. Well, Chandra's Outrage is like tier one in red, yes, but yes, yeah. But apart from that. Um, I just mean the bot sizing wise versus other creatures. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of three twos. There's a lot of two threes, you know, three threes, but you know, three fives, like giant spiders and stuff. I'm having being a four four is sort of like you're the big tough guy around. There's not many five fives. I mean, there's like frilled serpent and stuff that are four sixes, but yeah. they're very expensive. But my point with Epicure of Blood was that it just pairs so well with sort of other black and white cards you can easily get. Like there's the four mana deal three, you gain three. Um, Tenny Target or whatever, or uh, something Siphon. Yeah. Um, Agonizing Siphon. Yeah, yeah. And then in this format, if you get access, and if you take this card early, if your rare isn't very good, like let's say your rare is Graft Digger's Cage, and you can get an early Bloodthirsty Aerialist, mm -hmm. this card is bananas. And if you have a Soul Mender, you can imagine the damage that you can do where, you know, your curve is Soul Mender into, doesn't matter, into Bloodthirsty Aerialist, where this thing, essentially the turn you play it is a three mana, three, four. Yep. And then the next turn, the turn it's attacking is a three mana, four or five flyer. It's big. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. Just uh, just patently absurd in this format. So Aerialist is really good. And this is the deck that makes Blood Burglar playable. right? Uh, Vampire of the Dire Moon is a tier one card in this format, mm -hmm. or in this deck, sorry, in this archetype. Just a one mana, one, one, lifelink, death touch. Very good. Um, save it by time. Um, Angel of Vitality, which is the three mana, two, two flyer. That I guess... A point I want to discuss when you were mentioning Vampire of the Dire Moon. It's very good in this deck because if you have Epicurus, you're kind of trying to play the game into a spot where if needed, you can sit back and ping your opponent out, Yep, play defensively. And so then they'll have to attack past your death touch creature. Something like, uh, I forget the name, the Scorpion, yep. is not nearly so good because green decks playing against decks like Black White Life Gain or playing against Blue White Flyers have to race. And 1-1 one, one death touch on, a, like, on offense is trash. Right, but we just want to defend. Right, so the Scorpion is very, very rarely playable. Like, you can board it in for mirrors, and it's good if you can combo it with a Rabbit Bite. That's another combo. But the death, the 1-1 one, one Death Touch part is, plays very differently in these two different archetypes. Right, yeah. In Black White Life Gain, I, I always play the Vampire of the Dire Moon as a removal spell. I literally just play it as this will just kill anything on the ground. Yeah. You know, just kill a creature without flying. And you just sit there, never attack with it. You're just waiting because... You're just trying to assemble this combo where you don't attack of a board stall where you have Epicure plus Soul Mender or the Angel where you're gaining double mm -hmm. life or, you know, Corpse Knights even are good in this deck because you're just trying to play guys in board stall and just drain them slowly. Yeah, ping them out. Yeah, you're just trying to ping them out. So uh, I think Black White Life Gain is an archetype that people don't draft towards and I think is actually quite strong if you can assemble the pieces. And I think the pieces are 
pretty easy to assemble. Like Soul Mender and Epicure are easy. Yeah, both commons. Another common that isn't as synergistic but very good in this archetype because you're going slow is the Sorcerer, the two mana one three that you can pay six and shock a planeswalker, shock a planeswalker or player. Yeah, that card's good. Another just slow, inevitable card. Yeah, big fan of this style. So no surprise here probably that I'm a big fan of this style of deck. Um, you can also play like gra Grasping. Sorcerer of the Fang, that's the one. Or G Gorging Vulture or whatever as well. Gorging Vulture, yes, yeah, I mean, some life gain, you know, a flying threat, yep. This is also the kind of deck that wants Soul Salvages because you just want to block. Yeah. This is a deck looking to block, you know, Blood for Bones. These are all the sort of tier one cards you want. You're just trying to trade and block. You know, if you get a murder, life's glorious. Save the murder for a flyer. You can deal with everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's about it and how you play the deck. Speaking of Gorging Vulture, though. Yeah, if you wanted a bit of a more aggressive version of sort of a black deck in this format, Green Black Graveyard is another archetype. All of the important cards for this archetype that we have listed here are black cards, and a lot of them overlap with Black White Life Gain. So it's just sort of another direction you could take a black deck. And this is one where you're sort of looking to... You're like you're fine trading off your creatures in combat and then buying them back with things like Soul Salvage. And you have a couple things like Sanitarium Skeleton or Ferocious Pup, which leaves some sort of useless bodies around so that you can bone splinters or so that you can blood for bones back bigger threats that you've traded off. Yeah, Gorging Vulture helps fill your yard, which you can maybe put some Undead Servants in there because, yeah, again, well, you know, once you get Undead Servants in multiples, it becomes just foolish. Yeah. And you can eventually overrun people. So Green Black is a slow deck as well. Um, so you're, you know, it helps. I think also one of the green cards we didn't have on here that would be worth playing in here is Pulse of Marassa and every chance you get, but mm -hmm. also Netcaster Spider. Yeah, that card is a, very, very good. A card that can keep you safe in the green decks. Just the three mana, two, three with reach that when it blocks a flyer, it gets plus two, plus zero. Oh. Yeah, uh, slow green decks almost live and die by the number of Netcaster Spiders and Mammoth Spiders they have so that they don't get raced out by like things with flying or other large creatures in a Zephyr charge. Yeah, so... Yeah, just sort of keep that in mind that, yeah, while you're going to prioritize all these black cards early, I think black is one of the better colors, in my opinion. It's uh, flexible, yeah. Or it's flexible, I should say. It's not one of the better, but it's, it's flexible. I'm not sure what I think the best color is. Um, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, keep in mind that you, you use your green slots for reach creatures. And a card, a black card that I've really liked that fits into both of these archetypes, it's like maybe the sort of pinnacle of slow black cards. It's a, uncommon, but Gruesome Scourger. Five mana, three, three. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent or planeswalker takes damage equal to the number of creatures you have. If the game is stalling out and you just have like a ferocious pup and some tokens around and you have your one, one death touch, they're not attacking through and whatever and whatever else, your undead servants made some zombies. This thing very easily just deals six plus. It can finish games, uh, especially if you've already sort of been pinging them. It's that way to just sort of get over the last little bit. Maybe when your opponent's starting to pull out or get out of the lock. And in these decks with like um, Bone Splinters and Soul Salvage, or if you just trade it off, you can get it back. Sorry, Bone Splinters, I mean, puts it in the yard, and then something like Soul Salvage or Pulse or whatever can get it back to do the last points if the first one wasn't enough. So this is a just great in any deck that wants to go slow. Yeah, grindy, dirtily decks, which apparently were the only ones for time. <laughs> well, you That's are. all we know how to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Blue Eye Flyers is actually pretty aggressive. Also, and I, I noted that... The elemental the, decks are aggressive too. Yeah, the elemental decks can be very aggressive. And I also think Red White Aggro, which we're not talking about on the show, because again, I think it's obvious like you just take like Skyguard, Vanguard and all that. Yeah. Um, you just smork. Like it, it's quite obvious how to build those decks. Um, you know, Shocks, God Willing, some Pump Spells, easy. Um, but yeah, one of the other things is there's two different ways to build elementals in this format, right? There's green, blue, and green, red. And blue, red. And blue, red, sorry. There's three ways. And teamer if you're, if you're ambitious. If you're crazy. Any one of those sort of combinations, really. Each of them have different sort of combos. So they play in slightly different ways. But for the most part, they are somewhat aggressive decks that exploit elemental synergies to either build bigger creatures or a lot wider boards or whatever. Right, and one of the things, you know, if you're playing the blue versions, you can play Portal, right, which we already talked about, which is incredible with Frost Links. Um and a lot of the elementals have ETB triggers, right? Even overgrowth elemental, right? You can just start putting counters on elementals over and over again. If you have a Risen Reef, mm -hmm. you can just start going nuts. Lots of the green-blue elementals have very good ETB triggers. Um, the one where you pick up another elemental when it enters the battlefield. Yarok Wave Crasher. 
Yeah, that thing's huge. Is big in this format, especially for a blue creature, and plays nicely with other ETB creatures. That's it's one of my favorite design cards. I talked about this. I like this card a lot. Yeah, both if, gameplay and design wise. Yeah, it's really great. And with Overgrowth Elemental, it's a card you can start stacking, <laughs> yeah. and you can make you know a five five for four, which is wild, right? And then just keep growing them. You know, obviously, if you ever see a Risen Reef, you know this is a, Risen Reef just buries opponents. No one wants to use a removal spell on it, though they should. You should kill it immediately, but you there kill it immediately isn't that much can. removal in this format, so it's awkward. Yeah, but like I had a green blue elementals list recently and just played a risen reef on three, and my opponent didn't or couldn't kill it. And then we both had the same number of creatures on the board, and I had seven cards in hand, and they didn't. Like it just it's I would first pick it almost <laughs> and just could do anything I could to play that card. It's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, the red based elemental decks can be very strong too, like Ember Cat. Which in non-elemental decks is pretty bad. Yeah, don't play Ember Cat unless you can cast a vast majority of your deck with it. But if you can, you just have a Mana Dork. That's also a bear, which is fine. It's also a bear that also pumps your Lavican Brawlers that also plays well with... If you get an Uncommon Chandra, it gets pumped. Like That's the real, you know, that's the real strong one when you get to go, you know, uh, Ember Cat into Lavican Brawler. Yeah. That's a... In this format, that is, in my opinion, one of the stronger curves you can have. Yeah, it's really, really good. Um, yeah, so really just kind of any way you go. The blue-red elementals I found is a bit more tempo-y, like you get your Lavican Brawlers through with Frost Lynxes and then you finish off with Flyers. Green-red can kind of outsize its opponent or attack through with Trample. If you're a slower green-red, you might want something like Vorst Claw. It's pretty big, but it plays well with uh, Thundering Rhinoceros, Thundering whatever. The 4-3 that gives your other elementals Trample, so now your yeah. Vorst Claw is a 7-7 seven, seven Trample, so it's reasonable that's a yeah another good combo uh and then green blue is kind of just yeah card advantage make big dudes and be have card advantage yeah it's what you'd expect from green blue really yeah. winged words also still fine if you're paying three for it in that deck yeah and i think that's the green blue deck is the one that will take um leafkin leafkin druid leafkin druid overall yeah if you're playing green red elementals i don't think you want it as much you'd prefer amber cats yes but in the green blue version, you should be taking a bunch of leaf druids because you will have these big mana sinks and things to do with it. So, and it blocks a lot of the format too, especially um, if you have portal with that deck and you can start rebuying ETBs and spending a lot of mana. Yeah, it gives you a lot of the mana to recast the things you're picking up. Yeah, it's, so yeah, for elementals. But if you want to live dangerously and you want to build a crazy archetype, you can do it in this format. But I found it's a bit tough. The evidence, like the pieces, are there. They're sort of scattered and far apart, but if they you, come together, if you want to go for it. I think that you have to do it if you get the uncommon. That's destroy a creature that was dealt combat damage this turn. That's a common. Oh, no, no, the red, black. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Ogre yeah. Siegebreaker. I thought you meant Fathom Fleet Cutthroat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Fathom Fleet Cutthroat also insane yes. in this deck. So the red, black deck, the red, black sack deck is actually, I think, very good, but you need these pieces to come together or it won't work. But if you have Mask of Immolation plus Ogre Siegebreaker, I'm listening. Yeah. You can just Because that's a combo where you just repeatable six mana kill anything which is a lot of mana but in this format that's very good yeah um and then that's a deck where you're you can play active treason bone splinters mask of immolation because again mask of immolation with active treason to take something equip your like attack equip your mask sack it yep uh your bone splinters can sack things you take another sort of one if you're slower is a uh, blood soaked altar will let you sacrifice stolen things yeah so you're looking for ways to sack. One of the downsides I found with this deck is that you need also things yourself to sacrifice. This is a deck that you have to have Sanitarium Skeletons. Sanitarium Skeletons. Scorching Scourge are very good here just to make a bunch of 1-1s you can use. Yeah. The 4-mana Elemental. The 4-mana 1-1 Elemental that when it enters the battlefield, you make two 1-1 Elementals, and Elementals have haste. You just need a lot of bodies. See, like this card, I think, is just one of the perfect examples of what I find so fun about this format is we've talked about it multiple times and how it plays differently with different cards and multiple archetypes. It yeah. lets you draft very synergistically. Yeah, and also, interestingly, it's a card that on its own is on real bad. It's horrible on its own. Like, if you're not abusing the synergies, I'm not paying four mana for three one ones. Yeah, they just don't get through on their own. They don't do anything. On the ground. Yeah. Like, if they were flyers, then this card's busted. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just four, like four mana for three one ones. Well, with haste, it's a little tempting. But four mana for three tokens, basically. Imagine, you know, like, hordling, that's basically a worse hordling outburst. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not playing that limited. But 
when I get to abuse this with a bunch of mask of emulations plus ogre siege breaker and I can start just mowing down creatures because of this, like just treat them as tokens. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Bone splinter targets. So the red black deck is I think tougher to put together. But it's if risky. you can get the pieces, it's actually insane. It's risky because you can end up like taking active treasons, hoping to take bone splinters or hoping to take a mask and like not seeing them. It's like you should wait to get one of those first, but then like you still need to not die when you don't draw your active tree. Like it's one of those yeah, it's kind of hard to You should off, take right? active trees and last. Yes, it should be mask last. Is, and they usually wheel. Yeah, exactly. Mask is, yeah, it'll wheel. And mask is, I think, playable on its own. It's good own. on its own, yeah. Almost. Like, it's close. It's good enough. Because it can pick off, like, Cloud Conceers, Spectral Sailor. You know what I mean? Like, it's mask. good for the similar reasons as to why I think it's nice to have access to one Heartpiercer bow. You mean two? Right, but, like, <laughs> Mask of Immolation, the yeah, things yeah. you just mentioned are, like, very good one toughness creatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you said, just take that. Act last. Don't yep. never take an active treason over a playable card. <laughs> yeah, unless you like have a bunch of these enablers and you want to start stealing some creatures. Yeah. And so one last archetype um, that I'm curious about, but I've never actually played against or drafted myself because I don't remember the last time I saw an Iron Root Warlord in a pack is green-white tokens. But I've played against an Iron Root Warlord in paper and it just bodied me. Yeah, I lost this deck. It's um, like basically a three mana, three five, three mana, four five. It's massive. So yeah, and I'll, it makes tokens. It enables itself. I lost to green white tokens uh, earlier today, and I got beyond stomped. There was just actually nothing I could do. It's one of the few really good mana sinks in the format. Mm -hmm. Also, this made me realize that we didn't talk about creeping trailblazer in the elemental decks, but this should be obvious to you. Like, oh, to yeah, anyone that thing like this is an obvious inclusion. It's so very, it has very elemental on it. Yes. But <laughs> <laughs> Iron Root Warlord is one of those cards that is first off gigantic. You can't. Can you kill this thing? You have to reduce to ashes or murder or bone splinters. Yeah, and pacifism is horrendous against it. Yeah, there's not much else that deals with it. Sleep paralysis is not good. You just keep making one ones. Yeah, things insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can, I would, if again, if your rare isn't a bomb, and even if it is, I, it's got to be close to this because I think our, you know, I think Iron Root Warlord is one of the like, best uncommons in the set. Yeah, it's nuts. It's incredible, and um, it just there are actually a lot of cards that reward you for making tokens and making a bunch of bodies in this format. Yeah, um, I already talked about that two two that grows when tokens enter. It, that plays well in this archetype. Oh, it's incredible in this. Imagine every time you activate your Iron Root Warlord, you counter on this your other two guy. mana guy gets a plus one yeah. plus one counter. It's insane. And Ferocious Pup is something that we've talked about, which synergizes in different ways. The token aspect of it plays very well here. Uh, you also get your raise the alarms. So your squad captain makes a good five drop in this deck because it can very often be oh, a squad. huge. <laughs> squad captain is insane. In and green squad white captain's tokens. more like squad captain. Yeah. And might of the masses is like the amazing pump spell here. It, because you're going so wide, you can sort of maybe chip in for damage one turn and then attack and make your huge unblockable or one of your things that was unblocked a huge lethal threat the next turn with might of the masses. So this is another very good archetype. Again, you want... Green and white is a bit soft on removal if you're not getting pacifisms. If you have rabid bite and like an, a big iron root boiler, you can kill most things. But yeah, just another good synergistic deck. Yeah, I think I'm, that's about everything I got for this format. That should give you a good sort of, uh, yeah, you know, way in if you're new to playing M20 or you're just looking at, to solidify some choices or thinking about the choices you make. Just, just sort of try and prioritize these little combos you can make out of your cards and try and get as many of these small synergies into your deck as possible. And this is actually something that's like a lot easier to do on Arena, on MTGO, than maybe if you're new to drafting in paper. Because while you're considering later picks in the middle of the draft, you can look at the cards you've already seen. You have access to them, they're just there on your screen. And so if you're debating between two cards... Just look through, like, what does each one play well with that I've already picked? And generally, if one maybe doesn't look as strong in a vacuum, but it has more synergies with cards you have, it'll probably be better for you. Right on, guys. I learned so much. You do feel confident now? <laughs> yeah, I feel super confident. Ready to go out there and play your first game of N20? Yeah, going to go from bronze to mythic. <laughs> yeah, you should fire up a game after we go and see how it is. There's lots of options. I think it's a really well-done format. I'm looking forward to drafting some more. Right on. Thank you all for joining the club this week. Make sure, as always, you check out wizardtower.com for all your magic single needs. Don't forget about their MCQ here in Ottawa this weekend at the Nepean Sportsplex on August 10th. We're going to be hanging out there. It's going to be fun. If you want to support the show, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash podcast. 
We're also on Twitter at DWC Podcast One, Facebook, the Disorganized Wizards Club Podcast. And however you listen to the show, whether it's on Podbean, iTunes, any podcast app, leave a review, rate the podcast, share it with your friends. Everything helps keep this thing growing and bring it to new listeners. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. See you.